uh, mother, uh, a very happy Mother's Day. And with that, I also recognize uh, and, and realize that for many mothers, it could be a very difficult time every time we uh, come up to Mother's Day. And there could be many, many reasons for that. Uh, there may be even be women uh, who are barren and have longed to have children. And, and Mother's Day for you. I know in our previous church, a young lady, but it, well, actually she wasn't all that young. She was in her 60s. Uh, but she always longed to have children, but she was, the Lord just never opened her womb. And, and, uh, and Mother's Day was very difficult for her. And so there may be people listening uh, this morning, uh, uh, ladies that, that would give anything to be a mother. And in God's sovereign will, he has not allowed that. And, uh, and so we recognize uh, uh, that it can be a difficult time. And, and uh, many of our mothers have passed on uh, into eternity. Uh, they have fulfilled their course, their purpose. And many of us can thank uh, the Lord for the mothers that he gave us. And so this morning, I want to, if there's such a thing as dedicating a message, and just so that everyone uh, will recognize that uh, God's word always speaks uh, to each and every one, male, female, mothers, fathers, sons, daughters, whatever the situation would be. So this message is dedicated to each and every one uh, who was brought into this world in God's sovereign will through their mother. And, and that includes myself and, and everyone uh, else. Um, I think I'm gonna read what I put in the bulletin, uh, the best translation. Uh, some of you may not have gotten that. Uh, it's just a little story that I heard quite a while ago, but I'll read it as I read it or as I first saw it many years ago. But the story is told of four men arguing feverishly over the very best translation of the Bible. The first man convinced that the King James Version of the Bible was the, be was the best because of its beautiful, eloquent English. Another insisted that the American, the New American Standard Bible was far superior to all other translations because of its accuracy of the original texts. The third man far preferred the New International Version for its simplicity and flow in modern day language, making it easy to understand. After pondering the issue, the fourth man said, personally, I have always preferred the MMV translation of the Bible. Confused, the other three uh, said they had never heard of the MMV translation. I've always preferred my mother's version, translation of the Bible. After the others stopped chuckling, thinking that he was joking, he added, yes, she translated it. She translated each page into life. It is the most convincing translation I ever saw. Many of us might wish that we had mothers like that. Uh, I don't know if I should tell this story or not. It's so easy to get sidetracked, especially when you start thinking and have many years to think back on. Uh, but my mother made a very foolish mistake. I believe she came to know the Lord probably as a teenager. I did not know that until many years after I was saved. As a matter of fact, it was just before my wife and I left for Ireland along with our two sons. Uh, but she met a man, and that man was my father, and he was a very devout uh, Roman Catholic. And uh, she told me many years later that she made a decision. She turned her back on her upbringing to marry my father. And it was my mother, along with my father, but mostly my father, my mother, that taught me uh, all the things and uh, all the rituals and formulas and different things in the Catholic setup. And it would be years later uh, when she opened up to me and she handed me when we were going to Ireland a Bible. And it was still in the box. It had never been opened. The box had been opened and it was given to my mother on her wedding day. And as I opened the front cover of that Bible on the leaf inside was an inscription from my grandmother and grandfather, who I believe were probably products of the Welsh Revival back in 1906. Uh, and would have prayed for their grandchildren many, many, many years. And uh, I would have been the first fruits of their prayers many years after that. Uh, but the fry, in the flyleaf of the Bible, uh, her mother and father, my grandmother and grandfather, wrote these simple words. 
The family that prays together stays together. We never once as a family prayed together. And it was years later, like I said, that my mother opened up to me and uh, told me that her upbringing and everything that I brought home to her when I was 24 years old, having been saved, uh, she sat there and wept and realizing that though she had departed many years before, it was her baby because I was the youngest of three children uh, that brought the gospel back into her home and I believe ultimately into her heart. And uh, I would have had the privilege when she was about 80 years old of actually baptizing my mother. She took many, many uh, Bible courses uh, that I sent to her. All of that uh, to say that I wish that I had the upbringing that she had and that I could have read her translation of the Bible, uh, but she never uh, really uh, followed that. But anyway, I'll leave that for now. But I watched my own wife uh, laboring in prayer because mothers usually pray most for their children. And I know uh, my wife Lynn has labored long and hard for both of our sons. And it's not easy being a mother, not that I've ever been a mother, but. Uh, uh, I would understand. As a matter of fact, my mother uh, used to tell me uh, that many nights she cried herself to sleep. And there was one time after I came uh, to know the Lord, her comment uh, in a group of people that we were in, uh, she, uh, this, this was her comment. She said, no one is ever going to tell me that God doesn't answer prayer. I cried myself to sleep many nights praying for rest, not knowing what he was getting himself into next. And then when she found out that I was preaching the gospel in the streets all over the place, the last part of this uh, statement she made, but I think in his case, God over answered. When she saw her baby out on the streets preaching the gospel, recognizing that the vast majority of people think that someone out there preaching the gospel has completely uh, lost their marbles. But uh, in reality, uh, that's the place where I believe I found my marbles, so to speak. And guys, what makes it very, uh, much harder, uh, being a mother, is that they're married to us. And I think I should hear a few amens in some of those living rooms and lazy boys back there. Uh, I know uh, that uh, uh, I could probably make things a lot easier for my wife, uh, but uh, she's married to me. And so anyway, uh, we'll leave that for now and, and get into our message. And I'll just read an introduction uh, that I have written. But uh, among all the holy and virtuous women, whoever lived, only one would be chosen to be the mother of the Messiah. Only one would be called blessed throughout church history. Mary, the mother, mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The scriptures recognize Mary as a woman of humility, obedience, and virtue characteristic traits every Christian should strive for, esteemed by multitudes beyond biblical warrant and by others less than she deserves. Let us on this Mother's Day call her blessed in four different aspects of her life as we discover the real Mary, the mother of Jesus, has, as set forth in the Bible, the Word of God. And I am going to be following an acrostic, so it should be easy to follow. It's just going to be on the word Mary. And the very first uh, word in the acrostic is M Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus' humanity. The Old Testament uh, makes reference to Mary only in passing in a few prophetic passages. First of all, in Genesis uh, 3.15, uh, we read these words. It, it's the first, if I can use the word, uh, I was going to use the technical word, but the uh, prediction or prophecy that there would come one into the world uh, to redeem and, and to set right that which Adam had uh, turned upside down in the garden. And this is uh, the Lord God uh, speaking uh, uh, to the serpent. He said, and I will put enmity between you the serpent and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel the fact that jesus is referred to as her seed may contain 
a suggestion of the virgin birth. And then again in Isaiah 7, 14, uh, we read these words. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin, and notice the definite article, the virgin, shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And we know that the name Emmanuel means God with us. And then again in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2, a verse that we always uh, seem to read and comes out on uh, Easter. Uh, but Micah 5, 2 and 3 says this. But you, Bethlehem, Epaphrata, uh, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth, then the remnant of his people shall return to the children of Israel. Micah is speaking of a time when a Jewish woman would experience labor and give birth to the Messiah in Bethlehem. In the New Testament, Mary plays a significant role in Jesus' conception in her womb and birth nine months later. The passage that we read this morning when the angel came and announced uh, the Immaculate uh, Conception. And the Immaculate Conception, I won't get into uh, any, any all kind, kinds of other uh, different things, but the Immaculate Conception is in reference to Jesus Christ who was immaculately conceived. I had always been taught that the Immaculate Conception was that Mary herself was immaculately conceived, which the Bible teaches nowhere. But it was Jesus Christ who was immaculately conceived. He was conceived without the sin of Adam. He did not inherit the sin of Adam because he was conceived in the virgin womb of Mary of the Holy Spirit of God. And then the Bible next mentions her when Jesus was 12 years old, when she and Joseph took him to Jerusalem. And so the thing I want to think of uh, just for a moment is that Mary was the mother of Jesus. For Jesus to come into the world as a man, he needed a body. He needed a human body. For there to be a true incarnation, Jesus Christ, who existed from eternity, stepping out of eternity into time, needed a human body, flesh and blood, bones, structure, a body like you and I have. And that body was fashioned in Mary's virgin womb, and his conception was miraculous. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit of God. And then Jesus is called the Son of God. In Luke 135, we read and we read, uh, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then Jesus is also referred to as the Son of Man. We see this in Luke chapter 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That was one of the stated purposes for which Jesus Christ came into the world. He came into the world to seek and to save that which was lost. He did not come to be served, he came to serve and to give his life, the scripture tells us, as a ransom for many. I remember, and this is a little bit of a sidebar, uh, when we got back from Ireland, the whole seeker-sensitive movement uh, was uh, abounding everywhere, and people were trying to be, churches were turning their whole services into seeker-sensitive services, and there are certain scriptures that came to mind that simply say that there is none that seeks after God. None. And then I read a verse like this, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save. And so it simply tells me that in salvation, it is not man seeking after God. It is God seeking after man. It's not that I sought after Jesus Christ. It's that the Son of Man came and he sought me. He is the seeker in salvation. And one thing I really appreciate about Sovereign Grace Baptist Church is that they have that right, that it is Jesus Christ who is the seeker in salvation. And if he is the seeker, 
then we need to be seeker sensitive. We need to be sensitive to him and what he says and determines salvation is all about. And so Jesus Christ was the son of God. He was also and referred to as the son of men. Uh, he was, uh, Mary was his mother, but Mary was also the mother, and I'll use the word of others. Jesus was not her only son. In Mark 3.31, uh, starting in Mark 3, 30, verse, uh, starting at verse 31, we read these words. Then his brother and his mother came, and standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was, stirring around, was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle, and those who sat about him, at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my mother, is my brother and my sister and mother. And in Mark chapter six, in verse, starting at verse three, we see some of the names of Jesus' brothers. It says, is not this, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Josie, Josie is simply Joe Jr. or Joseph Jr., but James, Jose, uh, Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us. And the fact that sisters is plural, that means that he had a minimum of two sisters, two half-sisters. Four of his brothers are named, they are his half-brothers, uh, the product of Mary and Joseph, the those two coming together, uh, and she, she was a virgin until the point that Jesus Christ uh, was born. And after this, her and Joseph uh, enjoyed a normal uh, marriage relationship. They enjoyed intimacy. Mary got pregnant at least another six times. She had a minimum of seven children. So it says, and are not his sisters here with us? And so they were off offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. And so again, we see that Jesus had at least four half-brothers and at least two half-sisters. Therefore, Mary was the mother of at least seven children, the only, and only one of them was perfect, and his name is Jesus Christ. In fact, his brothers didn't initially believe in him. They basically thought he was a bit foolish and I believe at times would have even mocked him and I was just simply saying this and not that I know or could understand anything about this but bringing up seven children requires selflessness and I believe that Mary was a selfless woman she did not cater to self but she catered to her family she catered to others and she being dead, I believe, still speaks today. And I trust and I'm asking and I have asked that the Spirit of God uh, would speak uh, through her. Even today, the gospel according to Mary, even though she is dead, uh, yet she still speaks. And so in each of the accounts uh, of Mary in the scriptures, she's presented as a woman who was a faithful, humble servant of God even though she might be misunderstood. As a matter of fact, I believe all of her life, after she conceived, as she, when she was a virgin, uh, the rumors had, would have spread all around Nazareth and all around that whole area, and that stigma would have been attached to her, I believe, all of her life. The stigma would have been attached. If she hadn't committed adultery, then her and Joseph, before they were actually married, uh, had, had sexual relations. Uh, who in the world would believe that she was conceived or she conceived in her womb as a virgin? Uh, who would believe that today? Uh, but we know from the scriptures uh, that, in fact, that that was the truth. And so she would have been misunderstood. But even being misunderstood, possibly maligned in the community, uh, she was still faithful. She was humble. And most of all, she was a servant of the Most High God. And so on this Mother's Day, we can call Mary and any other mother here this morning, any other person actually, but because we're focusing in on mothers uh, this morning, we can call them or any, 
and, and any mother here this morning who is a faithful, humble servant of God, as she rears her children, uh, we can address them as blessed. And so that's the M part of the Mary acrostic. And now for the A. And we see uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 1 and verse 46. Uh, but Mary acknowledged, she acknowledged her sin. The only people who need a savior are sinners. The only way for a sinner to be saved is to acknowledge their sin. They have to do more than that, obviously. Uh, they have to acknowledge their sin. They have to acknowledge that they themselves cannot save themselves. They have to acknowledge that they need a savior. And they have to ultimately come to the knowledge of the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do when he came to die upon the cross of Calvary, where in his body he bore uh, the sin of, of the world. And so Mary acknowledged that she was a sinner, and she did that because she acknowledged that she needed a Savior. And that Savior was God, and is God, in the passage that we read this morning, verse 46 of Luke chapter 1, where Mary says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my, ser my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. She acknowledged that God was her Savior. And once again, the only person who can serve God and rejoice in God are individuals who have confessed their own sinfulness and that they need a Savior. And Mary did that. And we find her rejoicing in the Lord and serving him faithfully. Mary may have had one perfect son, but she herself was not perfect. That was something that I had to learn as a believer because I had always been taught that Mary was sinless, that she was immaculately conceived, and that she was a perpetual virgin all her life. The only thing that corrected those erroneous teachings was when I read in the Word of God the truth about Mary. And we have to take God at his word. That's called faith. I had to make a decision. I was taught one thing as absolute truth, and now I'm reading the Word of God, and that's coming forth as absolute truth but they are both contradicting each other. I had to choose. Will I believe the tradition that was taught to me, or will I believe the word of the living God, which is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword? And that word pierced my heart, and I recognized that that which I had been brought up on all my life, I had been taught wrong and erroneously. And I actually even remember my mother when she told me of her upbringing and and then I went through some of these different doctrines. I said, Mom, how could you possibly have taught me those things when you knew they were not true? And she just bowed her head. And she said, because when I married your father, I signed that paper vowing that I would bring any children that would come into this marriage relationship up as Catholics. And so I held true. And I left it there. There was much more I could have said about that with her. Um, we're supposed to, anyway, I'll just leave that. Uh, uh, but this is the truth uh, about Mary. She herself was not perfect, and she admitted her need of being saved. We can call Mary blessed this morning because she was a saved woman, and as such, Mary is my sister in the Lord, and Mary is your sister in the Lord. But one thing Mary is not Mary is not my mother. And she is not your mother. She was the mother of the Lord of the Lord Jesus Christ. She was the mother of his humanity, if I can use, use that term, that expression. Uh, deity has no mother. Uh, deity is from all of eternity. And Jesus st steps out of eternity into time when he took upon himself a human body. And so Mary is our sister. And we can call her blessed in the same way that we can call any other sister in the Lord who walks humbly, who walks faithfully, and who serves their Lord. And once again, I trust and ask that the Spirit of God would allow Mary to speak to our hearts, even today, even though she is dead. That's another thing that was taught to me, that she was assumed into heaven, that she never experienced physical death. That is not true. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. The wages of sin is death. And so each and every one of us uh, must die. And so the R in our acrostic of the word Mary, the name Mary, uh, 
is, is, is the word request. And I want us to focus this morning on the request that Mary made. And the Bible only gives one command, one request that Mary ever made, and the only request that we can see. And so I seek to follow that request. I seek to follow it on a daily basis. It, it's a good verse to memorize, very short. Uh, and I, I actually believe that uh, Nike, you know, that sporting good company with the little swish there, I, I believe they stole the slogan. They plagiarized Mary. Uh, in John chapter 2 and verse 5, we know when Jesus uh, and Mary and, and the others were at the wedding feast in Cana and they ran out of wine. And we know the, we, we know that whole situation there. And uh, she goes to Jesus and she says, you know, they're out of wine. He said, woman, what do I have to eat? What does this concern me? What does your concern have to do with me? He says, my hour has not yet come. And she simply goes to the servants and she says this, whatever he says, whatever Jesus says to you, do it. Do it. The word just isn't in there, but I can almost see her, hear her saying that. Whatever he says to you, just do it. And that word speaks loud and clear to me. Inevitably, when we lived in Ireland, Anytime I'd be knocking on doors or on the streets, I'd even be in the middle of a message on the street and somebody would shout out, what do you think of our blessed mother? What do you think of the, best, the blessed lady? And I would always look at them or if it was on a doorstep or talking to someone, I, I would say, I, I, I seek to follow the command, the request that Mary gave in the Bible. And she only gave one. And I simply quote that. I said, Mary says to each one of us, whatsoever he, the Lord Jesus Christ, says to you, do it. And then I look at them straight in the face, right in the eye, and I said, do you obey that command? Do you obey that command that everything Jesus says to you, and we find what Jesus says to us in the word, the living God, and as followers of Jesus Christ, part of the Great Commission is going out and, and teaching people to observe all things whatsoever Jesus said, whatsoever things I have commanded you. And so I just simply turn Mary's instruction to us on each one of us, even this morning. Are we following and doing what Jesus Christ has said to us? Whatsoever he says to you. And that's why it's so important to be in the word of God, because every time we open up the word of God, he speaks to us through that word because it's a living word. It's alive. Mary had first learned obedience. She herself had learned obedience as she was, as she willingly submitted to her Lord. We, we read that, you know, and she simply uh, says to the Lord, be it done unto me, be it done unto me according to your word. And so she herself had first learned obedience by willingly submitting to her Lord. Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. You see, Mary was not a hypocrite. She was not demanding one thing and doing another. I, I believe, I hope this isn't heretical, that may have got your attention, but I believe that Jesus as an infant and as a young boy first learned the scriptures through Mary, both in word and in deed. Uh, I believe that Mary and probably Joseph as well, but I'm thinking in terms of Mary this morning. And I believe that Jesus could have and would have watched his mother and he would have learned many things from her, him, her many godly, godly principles because Jesus was growing mentally emotionally physically spiritually socially in every what his humanity his he is he, he he had a human body he was born in, and brought into this world as a babe and and we can't ever lose sight of the fact that jesus christ was 100 percent human and at the same time he was 100 percent deity how you wed those two things together i leave that with the lord but that is exactly what the scriptures teach that Jesus grew, and he grew in all the various facets of life, human life, that you and I grow in. And yet at the same time, he was 100% God. Absolute deity, or absolute humanity, undiminished deity. 
uh, more theologically uh, accurate. But he would have learned from Mary both in word and in deed. And so are you expecting? This is a question I ask myself, especially as a, a preacher, something that uh, those of us who proclaim the word of God, God and, and, and do so uh, on a fairly regular basis, and especially for pastors and uh, missionaries and different things, but are we expecting from others what we are not willing to do ourselves? That's a very somber question. That's why the Apostle James says, be not many teachers. Be not many teachers. And I had better not be saying, uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> Paul over there in Romans 2, he says, you who say, you know, a man should not steal, do you steal? And we've seen many examples of different preachers, televangelists, and different things who were preaching one thing, but they themselves were doing something completely different. Mary was not like that. And so I ask each one of us here this morning, are we doing whatsoever Jesus is telling us to do as we find it in the Word of God? And then the last point on the acrostic, on the name of Mary. First of all, Mary was the mother of Jesus. Secondly, she acknowledged her sin. And third thing, with the fact that she gave one request, and that was whatsoever he says to you, do it. And then the Y would stand for yielded. She yielded herself to Jesus. And I want us to turn to Acts chapter uh, 1, and, and starting at, at, at verse 12. And here we're going to see Mary, the mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here we're going uh, to see her. Jesus has come. He has lived approximately 33 and a half years. He has gone to the cross of Calvary. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. And on the day that he ascended into heaven, the disciples were told to go back into Jerusalem, and they go back into Jerusalem, and uh, they go into the upper room, and here's where we see uh, them, and we're going to see that Mary was with them. So Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem. This is just after Jesus has ascended into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, uh, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. And then it names some of the apostles. Peter, well, actually all of them, uh, except Judas isn't there. But Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, uh, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. And then it says this, and the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And so you can picture the scene. You see these disciples, the, 12, the 11 apostles, obviously Judas is not there. Matthias has not been, quote unquote, uh, I was going to say voted in. He didn't get voted in, but uh, uh, when they cast lots, Matthias was the one that the lot fell on fell on who became the 12th apostle uh, but you see the 11 apostles you see mary you see some of the women uh, that would have followed jesus and you see his brothers and and uh what do we see mary doing we see her praying jesus has gone back to heaven and as we just stated jesus is with uh, the 11 apostles some women and some other family members and Mary is in prayer with the others. And she's praying, I believe, in Jesus' name to God the Father. One thing that is very, very significant is that Mary is not being prayed to. She is in humble submission, seeking God's will with the others. Mary is not on her knees in a mother-son relationship, but Mary is on her knees as a disciple. Before her God and Creator, she is on her knees before her Lord and Savior. 
that mother-son relationship has run its course. And Mary is on her knees in prayer and supplication with the others, crying out to Jesus Christ, her Lord, her God, her creator, her savior. The others aren't coming to Mary and saying to Mary, Mary, can you talk to your son for us? Uh, he'll probably listen to you more than if we try to go straight to the father. See, these were the things that were taught to me. You have to get to, to God through Mary as a, the media tricks, so to speak. Once again, erroneous teaching. Even at the cross of Calvary when Mary was there, the thief on the cross when he's just about to check out of this world, Mary is standing right at the cross, but he turns directly to Jesus and he prays to Jesus. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He doesn't turn to Mary. He turns to Jesus. And now the last scene we see of Mary in the scripture is she is on her knees in humble submission before her God and creator, her Lord and Savior, whose name is Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Another interesting thing, she's at the prayer meeting. She's at the prayer meeting. I don't know. Uh, I was going to say, I don't know what day it was yet. It was probably on a Sunday, Sunday evening uh, prayer meeting, but she was there. And so an application, very simply, what an example Mary is to all of us here this morning. Truly, she is blessed, as the scripture says, among women, not above women. Mary was blessed among women and is blessed among women. She was the mother of the humanity of the Messiah, the Christ. It was through the virgin womb of Mary, that the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one of God, was born and brought in through the incarnation into this world. But the scripture nowhere says that she is blessed above women. She's a saved woman. She's a humble woman. She is an obedient woman. She is fully devoted to her Lord. She is submitted to him. She was loyal to Jesus Christ right to the end, even at the foot of the cross. I cannot imagine. I cannot imagine the pain. And Simeon uh, prophesied and told her that, uh, that there would be a sword or spear that would, would go through her heart. And I believe that that's where it would have gone through uh, her heart as she stood watching her son going through the agony of the cross. And yet I believe she would have understood that this was God's purpose. This was God's intent. All the things that were said to her at the birth of Jesus and in other places, but she always pondered these things in her heart. She kept them deep in her heart. She thought about them. And now as she stands at the foot of the cross watching her son. Interesting, just the other day, heard that my grandson, uh, Dublin, uh, one of the neighborhood kids for a rock at him and picked him right off the, off the noggin, him in the head. And, and just to hear about that, everything in me, I, I just wanted to get a hold of that kid who threw the rock and, and, and shake him. And, and, just the, and yet to have Mary watch her son impaled upon a cross, the pain that she must have endured. But she's loyal to Jesus Christ right to the very end. And another thing about Mary is that she knew the word of God. You can't read through the Magnificat. You can't read through Luke chapter 1 and not recognize that Mary is quoting, and you can cross-reference many, many passages through the Old Testament as she's uh, quoting Scripture and applying principles. And so she knew the Word of God like the back of her hand. And then we saw that Mary was a woman of prayer. And so Proverbs 31, and I'm, I'm closing with this, Verse 28, could truly be said of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. And I pray that uh, for all of our mothers who are listening this morning, uh, that the life of Mary, her spiritual life especially, uh, would be a tremendous encouragement to you uh, 
and you say, boy, I could never be like that. Well, every, every person I read about in scripture, for the most part, I say, I could never be like that, except maybe Peter, uh, in all the areas that he fell and he was always putting his foot in his mouth and things of that nature. Uh, but these are examples that God has given to us in scripture to spur us on, to edify us, to set the goal and the mark higher and higher. And ultimately the goal is Jesus Christ. And that is our heart's desire this morning, that he and he alone uh, would be magnified and glorified and that he would be pleased to use uh, the life of Mary uh, to be an encouragement to his people. Uh, and then he is building his, his, his church here upon earth. So I'm just going to quote, I won't close in prayer as such because we're going to have another hymn and then I, I believe Max is going to close in prayer. But I'd like to just uh, uh, end up, end out this session with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that uh, your word uh, is truth. And Lord, there come times uh, when uh, Many times, actually, when the truth confronts error, and, and not just doctrinal error, but error in practice in our own hearts and lives, and it, 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 it not only confronts, but it corrects uh, thinking in the mind, and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. And so, Lord, we just pray that your word would have uh, that effect. And Lord, we do thank you for, I'll use the word, our sister Mary. Uh, who, who now is in, in glory, uh, awaiting at her resurrected body uh, at, 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 on that day when we will all be gathered together, that great gathering together that the book of Hebrews speaks of. Oh, Lord, that's going to be quite a day when we will all be gathered together. Lord, our hearts long to be gathered in our little fellowship there at the, at, at, at the school, Sovereign Grace Baptist Church. But Lord, there is coming a day when nothing, no pain, no sorrow, no death, no COVID-19, nothing uh, will be able to stop us and hinder our gathering together uh, where you will be the focus and we will be sur surrounding your throne, praising and worshiping our great God, our Lord and our Savior. Mary will be there in our midst and together we will be praising the one. Uh, our, our, our Heavenly Father and the Lamb who is seated upon the throne. Worthy, worthy, O Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.